Hi, welcome back to module XD3103, The Planet Earth. This is part two of the lecture on chemistry meets physical systems, really examining ideas of climate. So we're going to continue now away from the detail of ice ages for a moment, and we're going to look at the more global pattern, the framework, I guess, of why some of these things may occur. I thought it was a reasonable idea to look at the most recent statement of the IPPC uh, on climate change. And I guess that's the context for where we go from here. So let's now think about natural climate stability or instability. And let's think about factors that affect climate. As a proxy, we're going to think about global surface temperatures as a proxy, a proxy of climate. Now, that's nice and simple. And if we're thinking about the temperature of the Earth, we think about the amount of radiation or heat, if you will, that gets to the surface of the Earth or that can be absorbed. So in terms of natural climate stability, there are probably two sources of change. There's either extraterrestrial, that is the sun gets hotter or colder, and maybe the changes in the way that the Earth uh, orbits our sun, or if you like, in-house types of effect, terrestrial effects, effects of atmosphere or surface albedo. Okay, let's have a uh, look at the extraterrestrial effects first. Solar output. Well, over the long term, yes, uh, over the last four million years, solar, four billion years, solar output has increased. It's a slow, steady increase, and uh, we'll talk about that a little later. It's not affecting us on the short term of you know millions of years. The sun is not a constant emitter then in the long term, not on the short term either. The Chinese have been recording sunspots for thousands of years. Effectively, these black spots appear on the sun on an about 11 year cycle. These dark areas are cooler than the surrounding areas. They're very much magnetic. Effectively, it's a a display of solar tectonics in the same way that the Earth uh, has a tectonic system, so does the Sun. So we know that the Sun is not constant on the short term either. Solar flares, we observe solar flares. Effectively, it's great waves of protons um, which become the solar wind. And uh, we know we can observe solar flares so we know again that there's difference. Uh, let's just clarify here, electromagnetic radiation, that's light, takes about eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth. The solar wind, on the other hand, are particles, they're positively charged particles, protons, they take about four days to reach the earth. Now, there is good evidence, whereas for sunspots, there is no real climate signal that we can find, there is good evidence that variations in solar wind, that is solar output, do affect climate. So here's a plot of sunspots just to show you that from different time periods, no climatic signal, but they're periodic. Okay, let's now think about how we might get a handle on solar output. How can we uh, know what solar output has been. Well, it turns out that chemistry comes to our aid here. Cosmic rays come from supernovae, and although you may find it difficult, there's a supernovae going off probably every second from right around the three-dimensional shell that we can see from our planet, which means that effectively the cosmic ray flux to Earth is constant from all directions because these things are going off randomly everywhere right around. So we theoretically then have a constant source of C14 
being formed because these cosmic rays they interact with gases high in the atmosphere to form pro uh, neutrons and high in the atmosphere or lower down the atmosphere actually um, these react with ordinary nitrogen molecules 14 protons and produce carbon with 14 that is all carbon has six protons because that's carbon most ordinary carbon has six neutrons to give carbon 12 this reaction product has eight neutrons to give carbon 14 and a proton is given off in this reaction so theoretically we have a constant carbon 14 source hence we have carbon dating but in reality when you get lots of protons that is solar wind coming from the Sun then these induce changes in the Earth's magnetic field and they reduce carbon-14 production so uh, the chemistry is a first-order decay constant as with all radioactivity so if we have objects of known age we have a record we know this wooden statue was or whatever we can now calibrate effectively the cosmic ray flux by using our objects of known age which allows you to reconstruct carbon-14 fluxes and hence solar wind as an example we can reconstruct using carbon-14 solar output events that's only one way there are other methods but it means that for our carbon-14 actually is a method that works in the medium term uh, carbon-14 has a half-life of about 8,000 years so we can use this method to go back about 40,000 years okay now this is where we pick up the story because now we can reconstruct solar output or at least the amount of radiation that reaches the earth which is actually a slightly different thing um, let's now look at the way our planet orbits the Sun and this is courtesy of a Russian physicist called Milankovic our Sun does not uh, sorry, our planet does not orbit the Earth in a perfect sphere Abel in the physics lectures I think talked to you about elliptical orbits now this elliptical orbit is itself not constant in fact the orbit of the earth is changing as it balances uh, angular and uh, momentum and energy through the planets of the solar system so that the system remains stable which means that the earth's orbit is an ellipse which changes over about a 95,000 year time scale so at the extremes of the ellipse the earth is further away from the Sun than uh, maybe it would be in the same part 95,000 years later when it would be closer so that's the first orbital effect you would therefore expect to see a signal because the radiation reaching the Earth would be less at some parts in this orbit than at others so you would expect to see a 95,000 year variation you expect to see a climate signal which is a response to less energy reaching the Earth a, a cooling or a heating depending on which part of the cycle you're at the second uh, orbital factor is obliquity which means that the earth rotates on its axes but actually that axis changes it does this on about a 40,000 41,000 year time scale and that obliquity you would affect you, you would expect to see differences in where solar energy is delivered on the planet which means you would expect 
to see changes between summer and winter and more about that later. The third method is actually, yes, the planet is spinning on an axis, but the whole axis is wobbling and moving in that type of way. So this is called uh, axial path wobble or precession. And again, you would expect to see changes in the seasons with with this, in fact, the precession of the seasons. And it happens on about a 20,000, 21,000 year time scale. So we should expect to see three climate signals that result just from our own orbit around the sun. And I've listed them here for you. The 95,000 variation means you should have plus or minus maybe three and a half percent difference in solar radiation reaching the planet. That's a large signal. And each of these you should see some signal on these time scales and I've given you brief notes here on the types of things you might expect. Well, are there? We have our three potential orbital changes, eccentricity, obliquity and precession. It's quite easy to model these and this is a model of the effects we would expect from precession in terms of solar radio irradiation, obliquity and eccentricity. Again, about 100,000, 41,000, 19, 22 and 24 because the precession is more complicated. You can't sit on, on the Earth and, and say, oh, I'm just going to experience one of these. We experience them combined. So the yellow curve here is the addition of all the three uh, mechanisms. And actually, it represents solar forcing and has been uh, calculated for 65 north. This is data from the environment, mostly from isotopes. You can clearly see. 100,000, 95,000, which present themselves as, in fact, major interglacials and equally the cold glacials at the bottom there. You can see some of the fine structure here between these two. This is pretty good evidence that Milankovitch was broadly correct. You can see the climate signals from the effects of changes in our in our the Earth's orbit. Okay, that comes brings extraterrestrial climate changes. Uh, we don't need to talk about those anymore. Let's think of terrestrial changes. Well, we already in the last lecture talked about absorption and atmospheric effects. Um, so I'm not going to talk about those now please see the last lecture. However, apart from atmospheric effects, there's also albedo, surface albedo, which is um, the whiteness of the surface. So you can imagine that snow and sand would reflect more incoming solar radiation than maybe black peat and soil. So the final way we'll think about of um, changing surface temperature is the amount of energy which is absorbed and the amount of energy which is reflected. Any climate condition which changes that balance of dark and light will change the temperature which we're taking as our climate proxy. So for instance if it gets colder that might mean you get more snow. Snow is more reflective than the ground it's sitting on therefore you get a higher albedo, therefore you get a cooler surface. Uh, the converse if you've got heating. Which brings us to one of the important characteristics of our climate system, which is feedback, positive and negative feedback loops. And we can think of ice or desert advance or retreat. This is stolen from the Met Office, the UK Met Office, and it's a 
a diagram about global warming and in the context of global warming um, it describes both negative and positive feedback. So let's look at global warming first as uh, let's imagine that we global warming slows down. That slowing down creates changes effectively it will affect cooling which may give you more ice or snow which will slow down the warming which will cool the earth more and so the cycle goes on and equally for the heating whereas a negative feedback will be increase in ice a positive feedback will be loss of ice warming creates changes in this case you lose more ice so the albedo um, gets less reflective, more heat's absorbed, which means it warms up faster and goes around there. Okay, what I'd like to do now, I've covered some local detailed climate and some broad overarching. I'd like to move to the last part of the lecture, which is um, really about systems that determine climate. We've talked about the already uh, turnover times in reservoirs. I now want to close the lecture, um, or almost close it, the last part of it, looking at one of the major climate systems, which is the link between atmosphere and oceans. Now I'm going to handle this in two ways. The ocean has two types of circulation. It has surface circulation, which is wind-driven, and I'm going to think briefly, emphasis is on briefly, about energy, heat and matter exchange or linkage. And it has a deep thermohaline circulation, which we talked about with respect to ice ages. And we'll talk a bit more about that at the end of the lecture. And again, deal with it in terms of energy, heat and matter. This is a picture of the atmosphere. Well, the Earth, yes, but the atmosphere above it. And there are a couple of things about atmospheric circulation we need to know before we proceed. The vertical structure of the atmosphere, um, this is really just in the troposphere. So it's the lowest part of the atmosphere. And we'll start at the equator. So you have lots of uh, solar insulation is greatest here. The, the sunlight is most concentrated at the equator it's the hottest, which means you get the most evaporation of water here. That water rises, so you get saturated air, and as it rises in the atmosphere, it cools, forms clouds, and so you get most rain happening in the equatorial region. In fact, that air rises, rains out, and then at altitude moves towards the poles. I'll just stick with the north, but it's the same for the south. Um, and eventually this air cools and descends. So the air descending here is dry and warm. Let's actually think a little bit about what the implications of that are. When you have rising air anywhere, that means you have low pressure systems at the surface. And with low pressure systems, you get rain and you get wind, which we experience at the equator often. When you get descending dry air, as you do at maybe 30 north or 30 south, you get high pressure systems. Now, at the equator, uh, sorry, at the surface, you have, um, let's take 30 north, you have high pressure because you have this descending dry air and that circulation is in the northern hemisphere clockwise. Low pressure where you have ascending air gives you an anti-clockwise circulation. Okay, so our air has rained out at the equator, it's moved, we'll just stick with the north, move north um, where it descends and gives dry air, which is why at 30 north south you have deserts. It's not the temperature, it's the fact that you only have dry or mostly have dry descending air, so you don't get rainfall. That air continues then northwards or polewards across the oceans where it picks up 
a lot more water and heats and then at 60 north south it rises again so you have low pressure here and you have clouds and rain and wind so much the same as at the equator uh, again the air continues polewards and it's dry and it descends so at the equator and 60 north south you get rain at 30 north south and the poles you get deserts because the poles are deserts they're dry deserts in the same way that the major world deserts the sahara the gobi central australian they're at about 30 40 north except where maybe large mountain ranges push them a little bit further north but at the atmosphere is the reasons that you get deserts okay so here now are the surface winds um, just gives you a, a planar view and you can see that uh, 60 north uh, you have an anti-clockwise type circulation at 30 north you have clockwise circulations so high pressures here low pressure here um, obviously low pressure at the equator and high pressure at the poles so that's the surface winds now I'm saying that surface wind drives the surface ocean circulation so here now as the surface currents of the oceans and you can see here you've got anti-clockwise oceanic circulation the same direction as the wind and here you've got clockwise circulation at 30 north same direction as the wind so these are ocean currents surface ocean currents and you can see that they are actually in the same direction they're synchronous with the uh, atmospheric circulation okay we're going to think about these uh, first of all surface circulation in terms of energy heat and matter so energy is transferred by friction as well as waves and uh, Ekman pumping and these also transfer heat and matter so very briefly here is effectively a friction map of the oceans and you can see the driving points where uh, the rubber hits the road as it were where the ocean is driven from and you can see in wind stress in newtons per square meter you can see that structure and uh, you can see where the um, the ocean is being circulation is being driven by the atmosphere okay Ekman pumping um, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this now just a little time effectively anticyclones high pressure give you clockwise circulation in the northern hemisphere um, it changes north and south so I'll just use north and then I won't confuse you you just reverse these diagrams for the south um, at the equator of course there is none of this because there is um, no geostrophic force which we'll talk about now so in the northern hemisphere where you get a high pressure system so it's at 30 north winds are blowing anticyclonic now when you have a moving object on a circular a spherical surface which is what the oceans on the earth are you get an apparent force called the Coriolis force this whole area is called geostrophics but in the north that means that movement in this case of the oceans will occur at 90 degrees to the stress produced by the atmosphere which means that in an anticyclonic situation high atmospheric pressure you get flow of ocean water toward the center of the area if you want so you get piles of ocean if you like a hill of ocean on a ocean scale thousands of kilometers scale caused by the atmospheric high pressure 
that ocean piles up and gives you then ocean is liquid is um, the oceans are not compressible uh, non-compressible fluid which then that means you have more mass at the top of the ocean hill here and that forces water down so that atmospheric circulation causes a pile of water which causes oceanic circulation causes downwelling and the converse is true for low pressure that may be 60 north where you get anti-clockwise circulation so the ocean water in response to the atmospheric pressure gradient is pumped out of that area which means you get a if you like a a valley in the ocean surface um, and that then means there's less pressure pushing pushing down and keeping the ocean in one place so that outward flow of water from the center this divergence from the atmospheric low pressure gives upwelling so you it forces water upwards and that water of course has nutrients which has other implications for life which we'll talk about in a moment so this is um, called Ekman pumping and again a similar diagram green is the upwelling gray is the downwelling you can see over large parts of the ocean that these Ekman pumping occurs and is turning water over okay we talked about energy we should talk about heat so where if ocean water is being pumped around and we're thinking of that in terms of how much energy does that take in fact it takes sensible heat with it it's moving warm water or cooler water and what this means is that the ocean heats the higher latitudes it takes warm water from the equator and therefore cools the equator and moves it to higher latitudes toward the poles and this is a um, a picture of this time ocean currents warm currents you can see that warm water is being taken from the part from the equator and moved poleward and uh, this warms the higher latitude regions and cools the equator this is the current circulation now during an ice age this circulation stopped about here so much weaker circulation so the only that the heat was not transferred up to the poles okay if you want to put some numbers on it this is gross ocean circulation how much energy it moves in petawatts heat energy so this is just the moving hot water part of the system okay we were dealing with ocean circulation surface circulation energy heat and matter well um, I won't talk too much about this um, obviously gases are uh, exchanged between the atmosphere and the ocean that's very important for carbon dioxide pardon me because you have both physical pumps which is solubility and temperature and biological pumps photosynthesis and this works both ways it introduces some gases into the atmosphere which weren't there before and causes atmospheric chemistry and um, pumps or dissolves certain gases out of the atmosphere into the ocean so surface ocean circulation very important now we're moving to thermohaline circulation which is the deep circulation and you've probably seen the conveyor belt diagram before where effectively you get part of this limb is the surface circulation we've just been talking about so you get warm uh, equatorial waters being moved northwards as they go they are taking heat with them which is great but they are also seawater is being evaporated so the salinity of this water is increasing and it's getting heavier or more dense when it gets into polar regions in addition the water uh, because seawater is a solution of uh, obviously salt uh, and water 
the water is then first lost by evaporation or some of it which means that the remaining seawater is more dense and when it gets up here the water is lost in a second way it fr the pure water freezes out leaving even heavier water brine which then is so dense it sinks and becomes part of the deep ocean and crawls along the sea bottom back across the equator down here over this very very long path and gradually warms and density decreases because a lot of these salts are actually precipitated precipitated to the ocean floor and then takes part in the whole thing again complicated the uh, sort of on average the amount of time from the water being here going all through here and then getting back here is maybe 10,000 years maybe 12,000 years there are shorter loops there are shortcuts which means it can be as little as 8,000 years but thermohaline thermoheat haline salt this whole system runs on heat and salt um, and finally matter uh, I'm not really going to talk very much about matter here is a, a little example with uh, phosphate and carbon dioxide and it's a little bit of how the deep pump of carbon dioxide works carbon dioxide absorbed in the surface ocean is carried down with phosphate because many of these biogeochemical bio bio cycles are linked then the CO2 is uh, some of it's uh, consumed by regenerating phosphate some of it is it picks up more CO2 from carbonate being dissolved and then after the 12, 8, 12, 15,000 years eventually that water surfaces again and releases the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere so it's like a, a time loop pump I won't talk any more about uh, this at the moment okay so we get to the close of the lecture and we've talked quite a lot about climate we've talked about things that affect climate we've talked about the rates that climate can change at I'd like to close the lecture by talking about some of the implications of that some of the things we call climate change how climate change is delivered and we'll look at El Nino circulation which we've not talked about before but we probably should talk about it because it's it's important for what we're going to say so we talked about uh, circulation going poleward from the equator um, and you might have noticed that some of the oceanic currents and even the atmospheric currents seem to run around the equator we probably should talk about the Walker circulation which is a circulation which doesn't particularly work north-south but works east-west it's a latitude circulation and you've all probably heard of the Enso Southern Oscillation, Oscillation or the El Nino or the La Nina years. I mean, NEA published these on their website. Let's think, first of all, about how the Walker circulation works. If you remember the atmospheric circulation at the equator, you have low pressure because you have rising air and rainfall and this now we've got a latitude a uh, sort of longitude line across the bottom so this is Australia this is Indonesia uh, this is South America now this atmospheric low pressure means you have rising air to give you the clouds and the rain and that low pressure actually means that air in the vicinity is drawn in so this low pressure powers the trade winds those um, east-west winds 
which flow um, along the surface and in days when you had sailing ships the sailors knew where the trade winds were and that's how they decided where they were going to their courses they would set. Now this trade wind blows and you have an atmospheric circulation cell here and providing you've got the low pressure is low enough to force this wind that also forces an oceanic circulation in the way we just talked about. So you actually have a pile of water, seawater here, which forces downwelling. So warm water is pumped deeper, and that means you get upwelling here from cold water, which is full of nutrients, full of phosphate and things. So this affects where the fish live, where people get their living, and the ecology. So you'd have lots of phytoplankton growing here and lots of fish feeding on it here, much less here and so on and so forth. But this is about atmospheric oceanic linkage and this is a nice little, again, we've already seen that. But what happens if something happens in the atmosphere which were to change this? So now we have a situation where the low pressure which was here actually isn't as low as it should be. That means that the, the thing which was driving this circulation isn't there anymore. In fact, what happens is the low pressure tends to move um, back across the ocean. So these years you get weaker trade winds. The atmospheric circulation cell is much smaller. So you get weaker ocean circulation weaker upwelling so in these years when this happens you don't get all these nutrients you don't get the algae you don't get the fish so the fish die the fishing is bad the mixing cell is not very great so you don't get all this burial of warm water which helps to keep things cool and in fact you get westerly winds in the wrong direction behind this high pressure. Now, this situation is called an El Nino year. The uh, previous situation is a La Nina year. You can see that they are really rather different and where we get to is we talked about weather delivering climate our changes in atmospheric composition now being delivered by oceanic circulation this is a very linked system and this is both the beauty of it and the worry of it so let's go to the last lecture a last slide or so we already talked about the last glacial maxima it ended about 10,000 years ago and in the US if you come from there it's called the Younger Dryas the conditions around here in Northern Europe and North America were tundra ice uh, there was much more uh, actual sea ice in the Atlantic and obviously uh, ice on land. Now our evidence tells us that these climates changed on a time scale of 30 to 50 years. They changed from tundra, frozen glacier to temperate, broadly what we have now. It's been shown that the only way this is possible was that the thermohaline circulation which during the ice ages was dumping its heat out about here suddenly went into gear and pushed much more heat up here it's the only way enough heat could be delivered that quickly to melt all the ice so effectively 
the climate system, the stable state switched, and the stable state switched to strong thermohaline circulation interglacial. Um, and it switched within 30 to 50 years. What about the other way? If we look where we are on, first of all, the rate of increase in CO2 and the absolute CO2 concentrations, hmm, we could think that we could be getting closer to this abrupt change because it was clearly this type of abrupt change which gave the end of the last ice age rapid increase in the thermohaline circulation the converse is rapid decrease think for a moment about those parts of the world which are up at 60 north, 60 south. What the effect of a change in climate from temperate to tundra in a human lifetime would be? A little bit of sobering thought. So, the history lessons. Well, we don't know yet where we are on the climate um, continuum. But we know things are changing, we know there are different stable states, and we know that abrupt and irreversible change is, we've seen it before, it's happened, it's possible. And thinking of what happened at the last ice age um, is, is actually quite a worry, because we do not know how close to the tipping point we are, but we do know that that particular tipping point is both rapid and irreversible. Okay, changing a human lifetime. Anyway, it's uh, Tuesday morning, so let's get about our days, but think about it. This is not wild, hairy, hippie, alarmist stuff. The IPPC is the largest group of scientists ever to work on ever any, any single problem. They are saying very, very unequivocally, things are changing, guys, we need to do something. They've been saying that for 20 years now, and bluntly, very little is happening. So, I leave you to decide whether you are, on this matter, optimists or pessimists. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.